We notice that Narcissus' wishes are frustrated because he cannot find himself. Or to recall the Ovidian text, he cannot know himself. This is a problem with a twofold interest because if on the one hand it makes reference to the ontological uncertainty of the character, as we shall see, the poem also addresses problems of pictorial representation and its relation to poetry. It takes up the well-known Horatian concept of ut pictura poesis, a concept which was the object of much discussion in Vallecavides' time. So let us look at this other side of the poem. We read, and I will skip the Spanish. The nymph's beauty I cannot copy, for all I have are shadows, and I lack colors. Moreover, this painter coming, comes from a press, and when Narcissus looks at himself, his impression appears in white ink. Leaving aside some of the sexual connotations of the poem, the white ink, I won't go into that, especially if we were to read in it, it in its totality from these last verses, it is worthwhile to point out several things. First, Valle Gavides' reference to the difficulty of pictorial representation seems to carry a perhaps mockingly critical view of the polemic taking place between theoreticians and painters, that of giving preference to the drawing or to, li or to favor library colors. In the poem, we witness a complaint that in order to make a copy of the nymph, the po poem, poet only has sombras, shadows, a term which is at the center of the discussion by painters. It should also be added that the word shadow contains allusions to the identity of the subject. In the same dictionary of autoridades, we read that the word sombra or shadow meant specter, ghost, and, quote, appearance or likeness of something. The satirical persona's complaint that he only has shadows and is lacking in color seems to be linked to the representation of the self or subjectivity, this as mentioned mainly through a critical stance on pictorial representation. Maraval, the historian, quoting Saavedra Fajardo, affirms that the Baroque favored colors because they were what, I quote, give their ultimate spirit of being to things, and it's also that which best uncovers the movements of the soul, end of quote. And equally, in relation to Titian's innovative attempt at almost careless smudges, he adds in that it's 17th century, quote, it is judged that only this sort of painting gives an authentic representation of life. It is a painting of the unfinished, variable, movable, unstable, fit, fit to capture man on life, or life. Such approach is understood since man is in possession not of a complete being, but rather a being in the process of becoming, a fieri, not a factum. Therefore, correspondingly, an unfinished being and in a continuous state of change. Such a perception of painting as it relates to potential mobility is important to Maraval's view of the Baroque, for it is, it is seen in its social and economic terms. As one more example of the ideology that moves the Spanish state in the direction of fomenting cultural expressions and political institutions of a disciplinary nature and therefore promote a reaction toward a static society. It is my sense that a facile, facile transfer of Maraval's concept, concept to the new world is a common error taken by most colonialists who tend to think that Spanish 17th century economic and therefore social crises were being duplicated in the New World provinces. There's much documentation to the contrary, but again, that's an interesting subject for another lecture. To go back to the Narcissus poem, what we observe then is that, that in it there is an, an interesting preoccupation, quite baroquely so, with a precarious and confusing borderline between self and the appearance of representation of self. Furthermore, the cited verses, the satirical persona, juxtaposes his perspective with that of Narcissus. I quote again. Moreover, this painting comes from a press, and when Narcissus looks at himself, his impression appears in white ink. These verses take us now in a different direction, although a parallel direction, on the difficulties of artistic representation. The reference here seems to be that of the impression of figures on paper, or zoology, or xylography, Again, putting into question the uncertain relationship between the self and its representation, with perhaps a degrading or further unstabling element of self associated to the multiple reproductive capacity of printed reproductions. More important, however, 
is the fact that in these verses the impression that Narcissus has of himself impression as a word not only refers to the visual but also to a moral self-understanding attends to a greater dismantling of the figure. He is no longer represented by mere shadows but now through white ink. In other words, he is now a colorless and translucent Narcissus. My interpretation leads one to conjecture that, that metatextual reflections on the problematic representation of Narcissus and his frustrated desire for self-knowledge conform to Baroque preoccupations as expressed by Maraval, that is, of a self who finds himself in a situation of, of instability uh, or ontological uncertainty. What needs to be added, however, is that such reading of the poem as Baroque expression must be enhanced by looking at the text as cultural or colonial discourse, as a poem written by a resident of Peru's vice regal society. Let us push then the reading of this Baroque poem into its proper colonial setting. I'm almost done. It would be quite simplistic and erroneous, although perhaps approved by many, many, many of my colonialist peers, <coughs> to say that the poem and its parody of the Vidian tradition already expresses a subversive stance against canonical European thought. Such interpretation of a post-colonial venue, of which there are many cases, would give Galli Cavides an anti-European or separatist sentiment. A sentiment that he obviously did not have and would not rise in the New World until centuries later. What is important, however, is to recognize that Valle is born in Spain, but arrives in the New World at an early age and remains in Peru for the rest of his life. He is witness and participant of many social and political tensions of his regal life and these undoubtedly informed this poetic imagination. It is a well-known fact, although at times exaggerated, that these were antagonisms between criollos, those born, as I said, in the New World, or permanent residents, in peninsulars or Spaniards who either came to the New World as part of the Viceroy's court, or were here to gather riches and return to Spain. These groups, not to mention others, of various racial compositions such as castas, were always in a process of creating and dissolving alliances and antagonisms. The Mexican poet Octavio Paz, although speaking for the case of the Vice Royalty of New Spain or Mexico, says that many of New World inhabitants felt themselves to be loyal subjects of the crown, but at the same time could not hide from themselves their inferior status. Spanish bureaucracy disdained them. The criollo was and was not Spanish. In the 17th century, these contradictory feelings, says Octavio Paz, did not express themselves in political terms. Rather, they, and I would like much, I would, I would like, I would add much like here for Valle Gavides, they had an effective and artistic coloring. I think it would not be too daring to conjecture that the complex and contradictory psychological makeup of certain colonial sectors such as the criollo, a type of pilgrim at home who felt he was and was not a Spaniard, informs by his cre creation of a chiaro scuro, but also colorless and translucent narcissus. Curiously, it is interesting to note that in 1610, dark colors were linked to the bastard. That's in the dictionary of Coarrubias. Cuarrubias, and it's a lexicon, informs us that this word, that of bastard, refers to that which was made in the dark. But the reading of the poem in its colonial context should go further. Let us recall that the poem's references to Narcissus's portrait vacillate between shadows and white ink. That is, I believe, more than just a self-reflexive moment on the pictorial representation of his subject or a mere parody of the Ovidian myth. I conjecture that the poem points to one more instance in which Western literary tradition enters into a cultural dialogue with new world realities, especially as it concerns the already mentioned conflictive relationship between peninsular Spaniards and Creoles. The already cited historian Bernard Lavalle, although I think I skipped him, among others, reminds us that the critical attacks on the American continent express the conviction that the New World would have an inevitable negative effect on its inhabitants to the point that, I quote, on repeated occasions, even at the end of the 17th century, eminent Spanish specialists were directly asking themselves if with the passing of time under the effect of American nature intertwined with particular local life conditions and specific astrological influences, Creoles would not end up being similar in all aspects to the Indians. Furthermore, to this last historical worry, I should add some words by Juan López de Velasco, who in his geography, 
the universal description of the Indians from the year 1571 to 1574 says, quote, Spaniards who moved to those parts, meaning America, and reside in them for a long time due to the change in the heavens and the climate of those regions have some changes in color and human qualities. But the, but the ones who are born there, the ones called Creoles, although thought of in all respects as Spaniards, are actually in effect already changed in color and physical appearance. <laughs> now we should call should recall that Narcissus's conflicted self-reflection, on the other hand, ends up in absence. Both, on the other hand, also an occupied preoccupation with color. If this color be white or dark. Given the belief that Creoles could transform themselves in all respects into Indians, including a change of color, and given the many anxious references to the castas or dark populations of Peru through Valle satire, we should perhaps now rethink the poem in terms of an American Narcissus of the 17th century. Narcissus comically yet seriously conscious of all the social and political implications directly related to caste and skin color. Finally, I should perhaps also reflect on the fact that Valles' Narcissus sees itself as a nymph, a female Narcissus. As we have seen, a proper awareness of literary tradition, in other words, a knowledge of Perez de Moya's translation of Ovid, does not really allow us to ponder on issues of gender or sexual orientation. Perez de Moya's Ovid eludes self-love. That's why he, when Narcissus looks at himself, he sees a woman. This is he himself, because he doesn't want to think of self-love. It's a sin. Perhaps for moral reasons, perhaps for its sexual connotations, or for both. The sensual language found in Ovid's description of the young boy Narcissus is replaced by Perez de Moya, who obviously was used by Valle Caviedes, with the following phrase, albeit not example from certain ambiguity. Quote, Narcissus, believing himself to be a nymph from the same fountain, fell madly in love with her. Clearly this statement deserves scrutiny, but I'm running, really running out of time. For now, I would only like to suggest that the transvestite element found in Perez de Moya's transformation of Ovid, when borrowed at Valle Caviedes, generates one further echo concerning the ontological ambiguity or uncertainty of nascent New World subjectivities. To recall Octavio Paz's words, a Spaniard who is and who is not a Spaniard. To conclude, my approach to early Spanish-American selves in, Spanish, in, Spanish, in, in Valle Caviedes' anatomy of Lima's social body from a modern perspective, questions the idea of an essentialized self, a preoccupation much in vogue these days. But we should not forget that in the 17th century, as Maravaro reminds us, the concept of mudanza or modification became so acute and so decisive in the organization of the Baroque worldview that it came to inspire a transitoriness whereby the principle of identity tottered and along with it the very notion of being. This is a counter-reformist idea with many points of contact with our own modern or postmodern understanding of the self, although they shouldn't be equated. Valle Cavide satire, that of an American Spaniard of the 17th century, is informed by the Baroque worldview, an optimal view with which to reflect upon the conflictive nascent New World subjectivities, as exemplified in the case by conventional satirical burlesque types, such as the prostitute infected by the pox, the poor poet whom I skipped, or the figure of Narcissus. Thank you very much.